Chapter Twenty Seven of Oscar Wilde and Myself by Lord Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Smaller Fry. I suppose that the number of little poets, little fictionists, and above all, little critics who imagine that they owe themselves to Wilde is infinite. His peculiar form of humour which seemed to have genius behind it, and so dazzled everybody in Wilde's own time, was soon discovered to be woefully easy of imitation, and really to require very little brains in its production. The consequence has been that everybody who considered himself anybody took up with it, as it were, and it has become so common that it is no longer taken for humour at all. All our dullest young men, who happen to be engaged or interested in a branch of the arts, have talked, thought, and written wild for years past. Some middle-aged and elderly gentlemen who began when Wild was at his zenith are still at it, and apparently nothing will stop them, which means, of course, that humour in England has altogether lost both its point and its usefulness. The humour of the day has a dull cruelty about it, which it formerly lacked. Its object might almost be not to make people laugh, but to make them cry. The fiercer and more heartless it is, the better it is supposed to be appreciated. Furthermore, instead of being kept in its proper place in the scheme of things, it has been allowed to run riot whenever its authors choose to let it loose to be comic in a bitter and insincere way seems to be the ambition of most of the eminent people one can nowadays come across we have comic judges and comic counsel who manage to keep the king's courts in ripples of merriment we have even a comic magistrate or two in parliament the mordant humorist and the man who can say sharp things are the only ones to be listened to sarcastic bishops and witty clerics abound and as for the gentlemen of the press they are all bent on the leer at whatever cost if you look closely into these professed or unprofessed fun makers you are bound to perceive that the majority of them are little oscar wilde's to a man they look on life with a confirmed squint and they cannot see that there is anything human about which it is not desirable that they should make jokes. Only a little while back we had the spectacle of an English judge indulging his fancy in wildisms in the course of a trial for murder. In itself, his lordship's epigram, or paradox, or whatever you like to call it, would help or hurt nobody but the fact that it was forthcoming in such circumstances indicates pretty plainly the pass to which we have come. Wilde's answer to everything was by quip or fleer, or a plain perversion of the truth. He had no serious views or intentions about anything, and he considered that the art of life lay in flippancy. People who read him and make a gospel of him can scarcely be expected not to imitate him, and imitate him they certainly do, so that nowadays we have hundreds of little wilds, where formerly there was only one wild, and a not over big one at that. They swarm and spread themselves over everything that is decent, and they parrot wild at everybody who comes near them. They have seen it in intentions that there is no sin save stupidity, and that all art is immoral, and they imagine that the world can be run on these two remarkably shallow and unreliable axioms. I am quite free to admit that in a literary sense the world does present the appearance of being so run. The prepondering weight of contemporary authorship and criticism would indeed seem to be on the wild side. This, of course, is unthinkably pitiable, but we cannot get beyond the fact the reason is not far to seek, and it will be found to lie in the shallowness which always characterises the popular view of large questions. Wilde began by asserting that the only sin was stupidity, yet he ended with the assertion that the supreme vice is shallowness. I do not say that shallowness is by any means the supreme vice. There can be no doubt, however, 
that it is the very commonest vice among people who imagine themselves to be thinkers it is in consequence of this very circumstance that to attack wilde nowadays is to be howled down just as to have praised him eighteen years ago was to be execrated the shallowness of eighteen ninety five could not see an inch below the surface of wilde's glaring viciousness it went the length of taking his name off his own plays and relegating him to the position of a man who was well nigh without literary existence the shallowness of nineteen fourteen is unable to look beneath the success enormous sales enormous popularity and what not which have resulted from the wild boom and it is quite incapable of recognising or appreciating the dangers which lie beneath it we are asked by tearful counsel and writers of pathetic nonsense for the penny weeklies to forget wilde's vices for my own part i certainly do not wish to revive them or insist upon them but i am not prepared to forget them unless his apologists cease to discuss them nobody will question that what has been termed the revulsion of feeling in wilde's favour was largely brought about by the publication of de profundis this book which as i have shown does not in the least accurately represent wilde's feelings owes its success in no small measure to the wide publicity which was given to the statements that it had been written in prison and that it is a sort of repentant confession and authentic dying speech of its author as we have seen and as will become still more apparent when the unpublished de profundis sees the light nothing can be further from the truth the small fry may go on admiring wild and they may go on pointing to de profundis as a work of a sainted martyr the swan song of a contrite broken and bleeding heart and so on as long as they please but they will never get away from the hard facts of the case which are quite the reverse of what has been generally assumed and supposed End of chapter twenty seven Chapter twenty eight of Oscar Wilde and Myself by Lord Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To be done with it all. When Wilde had completed the De Profundis manuscript, he is understood to have written to Ross to say that he had rid his bosom of much perilous stuff. I will do him the justice to agree that he got into the De Profundis manuscript as a whole more real wild than ever he put into any other piece of work. Before he had given us, as far as in him lay, Wilde the artist, with frequent glimpses of Wilde the shameful liver and vicious thinker. But in the complete De Profundis he gives us Wilde the man, the bottom of his vicious and halting soul is laid bare for us in this extraordinary work that he had it in him to give himself utterly and entirely away as he did is incomprehensible and can only be set down to the fact that the reticence which had previously been his safeguard and saviour was entirely destroyed by his rage on perceiving that the life he had succeeded in living would never again be possible to him my own task is finished here and now i have taken what is practically wilde's own picture of himself and unveiled it before he went to prison he had exposed to the public gaze a picture of himself which was all lights and rose and purple to this picture his friends have been most faithful of their own initiative they decked it out with supererogatory daubs of pretty and bewitching colour, and they set it round with a beautiful gold frame, surmounted with a crown of gilded bays, and something which is intended for a halo. Of the shadows and dubious blacks and browns which Wilde himself prepared by his life, and by his lucubrations in jail, they have been anxious to take no notice they were only brought out of their seclusion as weapons wherewith i might be defeated 
the pot of blackness was brought into a court of justice and there emptied before the gaze of all beholders as was supposed for my upsetting then the mess was all scraped up as best it could be and hurried back to the british museum and honour being now satisfied and all being over everybody it was hoped would speedily forget the little black pot but not so it will never be forgotten and must always be remembered by anybody who wishes to look honestly at the features of wilde so far as i am concerned i have drawn my own picture from the man as i knew him and from his writings which are readily accessible and can be pursued by all who care to take the trouble if i had been disposed to write the present book in the vein of de profundis published or unpublished it would not have been difficult from a literary point of view for me to do so i could have embellished my pages with tears and regrets and moral reflections not to say with quotations from the classics and holy scripture just as readily and at just as great length as wilde has done surely if any man has had cause for tears and bitter regrets i have had cause all my life from twenty years of age up has been overshadowed and filled with scandal and grief through my association with this man oscar wilde i am not going to shed public or private tears about it and i am not going to waste my breath in vain regrets i have absolutely an easy conscience as regards my treatment of wilde both before and since his death if i have hurt anybody at all it has been myself and my family and i have done this only through misplaced loyalty to my friend and a too high regard for chivalry i now say all that i have had to say about wilde whether with respect to my personal relationship to him or my mature view of his complete writings it will be noted that just as i have refrained from weeping and moralizing i have equally refrained from details of petty quarrels and misunderstandings i have not accused him of gobbling my food and spilling my wine and devouring my substance i have not charged him as i easily might with corrupting my intellect and assisting me in the careless waste of some of the best years of my life i have never said as he says of me that i became a child in his hands and that we never met except in the gutter and never conversed except about loathsome things i hold that a man's acts are his own affairs even if they lead to his ruin and disgrace the shifting of responsibility is no work for me or any other person of sense i accept full responsibility for everything i have done or said in regard to this affair for my own indiscretions and carelessness i could not honestly blame anybody i have been punished for them and shall doubtless go on being punished for them but there they are and all the water in the sea will not wash them out this book is not an apology for me neither is it a work undertaken on the two quoque or tit-for-tat principle against wilde i am of opinion that in the circumstances there is no man living who can put oscar wilde into his true relation to the life and literature of his time more accurately than myself i have always known this though at the same time i have hitherto refrained from putting my pen to paper my enemies have compelled me to defend myself and if in the course of that defence i have had to tear away some of the undeserved laurels which have been heaped upon his brow and dissipated some of the undeserved incense which has been offered up at his shrine i have done him no wrong and i feel that i may conceivably have made a slight contribution to the literary and general good it seems to me a great deal more than probable that the present volume will rouse a considerable deal of what is called controversy the right of criticism is everybody's right and i shall not hope to be spared criticism or for that matter even contradiction i shall only beg that those reviewers whose duty and business it will be to deal with this book 
may remember that i am entitled to exactly as much justice in this world as wilde and wilde's friends the forces against me are undoubtedly numerous and powerful on the other hand it is very certain that i shall not run away from them end of chapter twenty eight end of oscar wilde and myself by lord alfred douglas recorded by rob marland